reward. So often children are collecting more what we are receiving in the regular offering. Praise God for your donations, for your support, and for your ministry. I remember when I uh, turned 50 and I was talking to my mom and saying, Mom, thank you for bringing me into this world, but I have already turned 50. And my mom was saying, yes, son, you reached the culmination. Now you're going down. You will see more wrinkles. It will be more white hair. You will lose your hair and so on. My wife didn't like that at all. But in reality, what I found out, what actually, what, when I see Filipino families in our church over here, they're not having any wrinkles. Brother German, I'm so happy for you. But you turn 70 and no wrinkles at all. And you don't have white hair. May God richly bless you and your family. Auntie Evangeline and your family are such a huge big blessing to us. Thank you for your daughter, to your daughter who shared the children's story. And we are looking forward for Pastor Kevin to share the word after this music and text reading. We are so blessed with your family. Happy Sabbath to all of you. I'm not Ezra. Ezra was supposed to be on duty, so he said to, um, he thought I was going to do, he, he thought it was going to be offering, so he said to sing his offering song. <laughs> <laughs> but I told him, no, I'm scripture reading, and he said, oh, then sing the scripture, so I'm going to sing with the kinky choir. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> but our, our scripture reading comes from, our scripture is Luke chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. And it says, and the word of God says, Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word.
Can we say amen one more time? Amen. Sometimes it's really hard to follow children. Everybody's like, oh, so cute. They're so, praise God. And then the preacher comes up and we're like, okay. No, just kidding, just kidding. Thank you, children. It was such a blessing. My name is uh, Kevin Kamado. I am pastor of Upper Room Fellowship, Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southern California. I know that there was uh, someone here visiting from California, and I see and there's a lot of visitors that come through this church. It's truly such a blessing. I would almost say that I'm not a visitor because I have been coming every year for the last 18 years to this church, at least once a year. Um, I am married to Evangeline and Herman's oldest daughter, Jerlyn. She gave the uh, children's story today. I've been pastoring for the last uh, 18 years, so really as long as I've known my wife, and God has truly blessed me. Um, as you can see up on the screen, well, actually it's not up there, but my sermon title in, in the bulletin is entitled The Calling. And as a pastor for about 18 years, I can kind of remember my calling into ministry. Growing up, I grew up at the Loma Linda Filipino Seventh-day Adventist Church. I've been there all my life. I helped my dad do the AV, the audiovisual, for 20 plus years. And throughout all of that time, I would always help out with church. I would be uh, doing Sabbath school with my friends. I would be up on stage just like the little kids. One of my best friends, his father was the head elder of the church, and he would always be doing children's story, and I would help him out from time to time. And people would always tell me, hey, Kevin, you know, you should go into ministry. You should do this. And I'm like, no, it's okay. I, I don't think that's my calling. I remember my senior pastor at the time, he was giving me a ride home. And as he was giving me a ride home, he was sitting, me, you know, we're in this car, and he's like, Kevin, you know, you help out with church so much, you really should consider going into ministry. And at the time, I was young. I wanted to be an electronic engineer, similar to what my father had done. I wanted to do something in that, in that realm. And I'm like, Pastor, you know, it's, 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 it's nice of you to suggest that, but I, I don't think I'm going to go into ministry. And going into high school and college, I had all of these things that I wanted to do. I, I thought of being a, a, a police officer, and I, I, thought, I thought of being continuing to go into electronic engineering. And here's the ironic thing. I wanted to go into electronic engineering, but I really had no clue what it was. So, you know, I, I was going further and further into that. And finally, I go into my first year of college at Pacific Union College. That's where I met my wife. I go into that first year wanting to be a high school teacher, and I wanted to teach history. I wanted to teach religion, so I wanted to either teach at a public school or teach at one of our Adventist schools, so I can kind of do both. I wanted to be a history teacher and couple the history with the religion and Bible. And so I went into my first year. I went into my first year going and doing all the prerequisites for education, high school education, history, and religion. And throughout that time, I was like, okay, somewhat enjoying it. And I go back home at the end of my first year. And my youth pastor, some of you might know him, some of you, actually he came and spoke a few years ago. His name is Pastor Manuel Vitug. Uh, he's from the Loma Linda area. He was my youth pastor. One thing that he did as a pastor was he was a high school teacher and a youth pastor. And he's like, Kevin, I don't know what you're wanting to do. But you know what? God is calling you into the ministry. He's like, okay. Let me think and pray about it a little bit more. And I think that was probably one of the first times I had sat down and thought about it. Like, okay, God is, you know, people have been telling me. My pastors have been telling me. People saying, hey, you're, you're, you're great as a leader in the church. Why don't you go into the ministry? And for time and time again, I thought of my own. I took my own actions. I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to go ahead and take my own path. And so finally, my youth pastor, he says, why don't you consider it? And so I literally stopped and I considered. And I started to pray. And I started thinking. All of my friends that I had grown up with, they were starting to leave the church. They were not in church anymore after high school and college, but they were still friends with me. And so from there, I was like, hey, come on. I started trying to invite them, but I still kept my friendships with them. And even though some of them didn't come back to church necessarily, because they knew that I 
answered the call to be a pastor, they were willing to have spiritual conversations with me. Brothers and sisters, calling is one of the most important things that we can consider as a follower of Jesus Christ. But we have to also understand that calling is not necessarily to the ministry. So many people and so many times they think that if I accept this calling, then I have to be up here on stage. Right? And that freaks people out. They're like, I can't come up here and preach like Pastor Vasili. I can't preach like Pastor Kevin. I can't be like any of the elders. I can't do children's story. I can't sing songs. I can't do any of those things. But be, being called into the ministry is something that is almost outside of the church. Because it is in your home context. It is with the people that you interact with on a daily basis that is your ministry and today we're going to be diving into a story that we know very well but seeing it a little bit deeper from the perspective of what truly is our calling the, the word the scripture is not going to be on the screen we're going to be going old-fashioned style so please open your bibles with me if you have your bibles or if it's on your phones we're going to be opening up our bibles to luke chapter 5 luke chapter 5 Starting in verse 27. When you're all there, please say amen. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 27. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. Luke chapter 5. Starting in verse 27, the word of God says this. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him. When their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Brothers and sisters, this is the story of Jesus calling one of his disciples, one of his very own, very close disciples, Matthew, Levi, and to give you some personal, uh, to give you some context to the background of this, all right, we see from this passage that Matthew was a tax collector. And to give you an understanding, the Roman people collected taxes slightly differently. They would go through a system called tax farming. And so basically they would assess the district, assess the or area, and they would collect taxes or they would give this to the highest bidder, okay? So they would see this area, they say, okay, this is the certain amount, and whoever wants to buy this, they will get it, but they have to pay taxes every year to us. And so the person who had the most money to buy it from the Romans would get it. But here's the thing, the Romans would only set a certain price. Let's say this one area was only 500 denarii, only five. But they wouldn't say, okay, well, any excess you have to give us. You just give us the 500, and that's it. So this rich person who would buy off that property, now he would have to pay 500 denarii in taxes to the Romans. But he would start charging people six, seven, eight hundred, all of these things. And that's how you can see tax collectors becoming so rich. Now here's the thing, and some of you might have already understood this from stories like Zacchaeus. Tax collectors were their own people, Jewish people, taxing their own, their own people so that they can get rich off of their own people's money. Now, if we just hear that, that's horrible. We don't like that, right? But that's how it was. People wanting to get rich. Tax collectors were not seen as almost anything. They, did, they were not allowed to go into the synagogues. They were not allowed to be witnesses in court. They were low of the lowest. People did not want to be around them knowing that they were going to be taxed extra. So if you're walking through this city and all of a sudden you see a tax collector booth, you're like, all right, the tax is five. Oh man, it's Matthew. I know he's gonna tax me 10, he's gonna tax me 12, and pocket the rest. 
These tax collectors were so low on the totem pole. They were coupled in with prostitutes, coupled in with murderers. They were coupled in with just people who were rejected by society. But the calling of Matthew is very interesting and important for us. Because of this person who was such so low on the totem pole, Jesus stopped and called him. Did you ever stop to think about that? Jesus stopped to call this person who, from society's standards, was an outcast. From society's standards, was just someone who was not regarded as a person at all. No one wanted to be around him. And Jesus called him. But Matthew's reaction is something that we need to learn from. Not only Jesus is calling, because brothers and sisters, we should hear this in our minds. Jesus called Matthew and Jesus calls each and every one of you. Amen? Amen. Jesus stands at the door of, of your heart and knocks. If anyone opens the door, he will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Meaning that Jesus is constantly knocking on the door of your heart. He's knocking on the door of the hearts of our children. Those of you that have been in the church for 30, 40, 50 years, all your life, and maybe you're coming to the church for the very first time, Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. He's waiting there patiently. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? It's a beautiful song. And so when we see this story, that Jesus calls him, Jesus probably had been walking around the Galilean area, and he was preaching in the Capernaum area, gaining more and more reputation. Those of you that remember the old uh, Uncle Arthur bedtime stories, right? You have those old books. Um, it's one of them. It talks about Zacchaeus. And I love how that story just goes, how Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was doing things facetiously. He was doing things just so wrongly and cheating his own people. But as he heard about Jesus down near the water, as he went and go see Jesus, Jesus is there. He, he, he hears all these things. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes one day as he's passing through Jericho, looks up on a tree where Zacchaeus is wanting to listen. No one wants to let Zacchaeus in. No one wants him to come through the doors of the church. Mercy, am I saying it? Because he's unwanted, because he's a newbie, because he's maybe poor, because he's not Adventist, because he's not Christian. They didn't want him to come in through the doors of the church. Hmm. And everybody here is saying happy Sabbath. I'm saying it, brothers and sisters, because we need to hear it. We have a beautiful church. Uh, you know, I, I remember when the church was flipped and you know, the renovations, and now there's a beautiful church here. You know, my own church now, I have a beautiful, beautiful building, beautiful campus. Sometimes we have deer roaming around the campus in the morning, Sabbath morning. But if we are not following Jesus' example of calling people, then we are not trusting and obeying what God called us to do. I remember one time at a church that I was just a member at, I was not a pastor yet, this woman was arguing with some of the elders about the evangelistic series that was going on. She was saying, man, we need to be careful, otherwise we're going to be having strangers in our church. This is what my head elder or my former head elder says every time you come and visit our church. You come to our church, your family. That's what church is all about. That's what Jesus is here. He sees Matthew, a tax collector, Levi, a tax collector. And it says here, and this is the beautiful thing in the book of Luke, because Luke has just a little bit more information that we get from the other passages. In the book of Matthew, in the book of Mark, it says Jesus came to Levi and he says, come and follow me. Levi 
went and followed Jesus immediately. But this is what it says in the book of Luke. It says, after these things, he went out, saw the tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. He said to him, follow me. Okay, we're treading along with the other gospels. And then verse 28. So he, what does it say? He left all. He rose up and he followed him. This is where it's going to start getting more, in, more information, brothers and sisters. He left all. He rose up and then he followed him. Let's consider those three points right there. Jesus gives Matthew Levi a call. And that's what Jesus is giving each and every one of you. God has given each and every one of you a call. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 19, it says, 4, verse 19 and 20, it says, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. And I love the play on words that Jesus has because he's talking to Andrew, Peter, James, and John, fishermen, right? This was their livelihood. All they did would go out and they would cast their nets and they would bring in, and that was, and that if they, whatever they brought in, that was the money that they got to live off of. And so Jesus comes and sees them. They had not caught anything. My wife just shared the story this morning with the kids. They had not caught anything. They're about to come back to shore. And Jesus, who is not a fisherman, who is a carpenter, tells a skilled fisherman, right? Just those of you that raised your hand that are fishermen, right? I saw a hand over here. If me, who is a pastor, came up to you and says, hey, Oh, you got to use this lure. Oh, you got to use this. You'd be looking at me crazy, right? Like, who do you think you are? But Jesus, he knew he was talking about. He says, why don't you cast on the other side? And the beautiful thing about that story, brothers and sisters, if you don't know from Matthew chapter 4, you can go to the end of the book of John. It's the same calling that Jesus had for Peter and Andrew, James and John. At the beginning of their life ministry, they weren't sure what they were going to do. Their calling was uncertain. Well, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a, a fisherman. Andrew, Peter's brother, had been listening to John the Baptist talk about Jesus. And finally, he hears Jesus preach. And Jesus calls him. And Andrew comes running into the house with Peter. And Peter is like, what's going on? Why are you so excited? And Andrew says, Peter, we have found the Messiah. We have found the one. He is calling us. And Peter's like, okay, we'll see how that goes. But see, are, are you starting to see the interesting thing, brothers and sisters? Andrew went to whom? His brother. And that's an important part for us to understand. Because when we get a little bit further into the story of Matthew Levi, you'll see why. Andrew went immediately to his brother. His brother Peter was skeptical. His brother Peter was unsure. But since it was his brother whom he loved so much, he said, you know what, I'll check it out. So they went to the sea where Jesus was preaching. They went to go fish. They're all there and they didn't catch anything. Jesus is preaching on the shore and they come to shore with nothing. Jesus says, go back out and cast your net on the other side where it is sunny, where fish will be able to see the nets. You won't be able to catch anything from an experienced fisherman's point of view. And then all of a sudden, they throw it into the net. And I love how Ellen G. White and Uncle Arthur des describes it. The moment the water, the net fit, hits the, the water, it gets filled. It's like as if the fish are swimming towards the net, right? The fish are swimming towards the net, jumping into this net, not realizing what's going on, and they have no way to pull it in, just Andrew and Peter. So they call James and John, their friends, their counterparts, fishermen, and they come and pull this in. And Peter's like, what's going on? And Jesus looks at him and he says, come and follow me. Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And at the end, after Jesus died on the cross, after these fishermen did not know what to do when their Messiah was dead, and they weren't sure if he had been risen, they see someone off in the distance who does the same thing. They had been fishing all night. They caught nothing. And Jesus says, 
throw it on the other side. And the moment that happens, Peter jumps out of the boat. They're not even all the way back. And he says, Lord my God. He comes to his Savior. Jesus is calling you. Jesus is calling you, brothers and sisters. But you do not have to be a pastor, an elder of the church, a song leader. You do not have to be that to answer the call. If you are a plumber, if you are an electrician, if you are a nurse, if you are a student, if you are a young child, the Savior is calling you today to be one of His very own. You know, I have been at my church, Upper Room Fellowship, for the last 10 years. And I remember my call to that church. I was at Andrews University. It was my last year. And uh, they were calling me. And I was like, okay, well, we'll see. Like, I wasn't sure. They called me. Now, just to give some background, I, I had maybe a few, few credits to finish up. So I wasn't quite finished. And so the conference official, he called me and he says, hey, Pastor Kevin, Upper Room Fellowship is looking for a pastor. And I was like, thank you so much. I'm not done with my schooling yet. I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to make sure that I finish everything. You know, I don't, want to ha I don't want to have the church wait a long time. See, so please, thank you for the call. I'm going to go ahead and just decline for now. They're like, are you sure? I go, yes. And then a few months later, two to three months later, they call back. Pastor Kevin They've been praying about it. They really like you. They want you to come back. I was like, they want you to come. And I was like, I, I need to finish. They're like, we're willing to wait. I was like, wow, okay. They were willing to wait for me. And so I said, okay, give me some time to think and pray about it. And so there was this building that I was overseeing. And I went into this building and I literally cut myself off from everything. Um, I turned off all, anything that was like Wi-Fi related, I shut off my phone, I just, I just, I just shut off everything, unplugged everything, just, I was literally just disconnected, I was in this room, and I was sitting there praying, I was praying, Lord, if this is the calling, I want, I don't know, I want something, like a sign to just pop up into the sky and say, go to URF, Upper Room Fellowship. I really was. I was praying these things, waiting for that call to happen. And I was sitting there praying for an hour, nothing. So just to give you a little more context, I called my mentor when I got the first call. And he says, why didn't you take it? I said, I, I, I'm really committed to my studies. I want to follow my studies. I want to finish it. He's like, okay, I respect that. So that was my mentor after the first call. I'm in this room after the second call, thinking and praying about it. Everything shut off. And then I said, okay, an hour has passed. I've seen no sign, nothing. You know, some of you have seen that. You, you close your Bible, you flip open, you're like, okay, is this the answer? And no, it wasn't, right? I did that. For a whole hour, nothing. I didn't hear anything. I didn't, you know. And I was like, okay, fine. I take my phone and I turn it on. And literally, the very second it turns on, my mentor calls me back. And he says, you need to take this call. I was like, okay. God, you're calling me. Because you know that in that passage back in Matthew chapter 4, it doesn't say you will be great fishermen. It says, I will make you great fishermen. Brothers and sisters, again, Jesus is calling. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer for him today? He wants to come into your heart because he knows that the moment you let him in, he will do a mighty and great work in and through you. If you're a child, if you're an elder, whatever it is, he wants you to do great things because he knows he can do great things through you. And so in this passage with Matthew, we're looking at this and we're like, Matthew, who was a tax collector, who didn't think he was going to be anything else but a tax collector, sees the Messiah 
calling him. His life was almost meaningless because his own people hated him. And Jesus says, come and follow me. You translate that word and it's not just follow, but it says obey, to chase after. He's like, I want you to come after me, follow me, look at how I do things. And Matthew was like, you know what? Society and my own decisions have labeled me as a tax collector, but he is now labeling me as one of his disciples. And so Matthew, his response was, he was willing to let go. He was willing to leave all. Leave all. Now, we're like, well, he left all. He left his home. He left his money. He left all those things. Some of you are like, man, I have a wonderful house. I don't know if I can leave that house. Right? I have wonderful things. No, brothers and sisters. Do you know why I know this? Because just a few passages later, where did Matthew invite Jesus and all of his friends? To his beautiful home. What he left was his old way of thinking. What he left was his sins behind him at the feet of the cross of Jesus. What he left was his old life to pursue a new life in which Jesus can give him. Amen? This is what Matthew's response was and what our response can be. He left all. Leave that old way of thinking, thinking that you cannot preach a sermon up here, thinking that you cannot sing a song up here, thinking that you cannot go door to door out to people around you, thinking that you cannot do ministry, Thinking that you're not good enough. And yes, brothers and sisters, the Bible says, For all have fallen short of the glory of God. But we, brothers and sisters, because of what Christ can do in us, and Matthew is that example of it, we can do many things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? Amen. So why? Why are we thinking we cannot? I have this analogy that I tell a lot of the kids when I do high school um, you know, week of prayers and stuff. I go up to one of them and I say, are you a car? And they're like, what are you talking about? Are you a car? It's like, no, I'm not a car, I'm a kid. Okay, then why do you believe the things that Satan tells you? Because you are not. Why do you believe that you are incapable of preaching the word through loving care and ministry in your own homes? Why do you believe that when Satan says you are unworthy, that Christ did not come? Christ came for you, brothers and sisters. Paul, who was one of the most prolific writers of the Bible, and who was one who, who attacked the church, you know, he killed many of the believers of Christ. He says, I am a sinner and one of the greatest. And yet, it is because of Christ, I am able to do these things. Matthew, his response was, I leave it all behind and I move forward anew with Christ. I left all. See, he left all. But there's the next word, pass, verse, or word in verse 28. He left all. He was willing to give up those old thoughts, those old thinking. But he rose up. Brothers and sisters, we are, we are churchgoers. And so we go to church and we sit on these beautiful benches in a beautiful air-conditioned room. And God forbid we become bench warmers. Some of you might understand what I'm talking about. Those of you that are in the sports analogy, you understand that. Bench warmers are the people that don't go up to play. They sit on the bench and they warm the bench for the other players. Right? But sometimes we as Christians, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we can become bench warmers because we walk through these doors, we sit in these benches, and when the pastor is done preaching and we're all done walking out those doors, 
everything that he has been talking about, everything that you have studied during Sabbath school, everything that you have done and thought of throughout the week is gone. And I say this only because, brothers and sisters, I tell it to my church, I tell it to myself. We must not become bench warmers. God did not call us to do a holy huddle on an island, to be a secluded Seventh-day Adventist church. He has called us, just as we go on to the rest of the passage, He rose up. Matthew, Levi, physically rose up. And He followed after Jesus. He followed His example. Do you see that? He got up. And he followed Jesus. Because what did he do next? Then, verse 29, Then Levi gave a great feast in his own house. There it is, brothers and sisters. He gave a great feast. And he invited more tax collectors. And he invited more sinners. He invited the unsavory of society. Do you know why? He didn't think of what the other church members are going to think. He didn't think that. He didn't care, oh, is what so-and-so going to say if I invite these people? He did not think that. What he thought was, I am following Jesus, who called me a tax collector, who is one of the unsavory, and he chose me to follow after him. And so because of that, I too will follow my Savior now, and I will start inviting people through these doors to my own home and introduce them to Jesus. Ellen White says, one of our prolific writers in Adventism, she says this in the... SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, she says, In his great humility, Matthew desired to show his appreciation of honor bestowed upon him and calling together those who had been his associates in business, in pleasure, and in sin. He made a great feast for the Savior. If Jesus would call him, who was so sinful and unworthy, he would surely accept his former companions who were thought Matthew far more deserving than himself. Matthew had a great longing that they should share the benefits and the mercies and the grace of Christ. He desired them to know that Christ did not, as the scribes and the Pharisees despised and hated the publicans and sinners. He wanted them to know Christ as the blessed Savior. And I'm going to say this, brothers and sisters, and I'm going to say it, and if you never invite me again to this church, I understand. But please understand me when I say this. They were not invited to an Adventist church. They were invited to meet the Savior. And they met the Savior at the house of another sinner. They met the Savior at your house. They met the Savior at your store. They met the Savior at your school. They met the Savior outside the church. And don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters. Salvation doesn't, become, doesn't come because of the church. Salvation comes through the church. Which means, going back to this passage right here at the end, the Savior did not come to seek and save. Uh, a vision doesn't need to come because of those that are sick. But the, those that are well, but those that are sick. You here in this church, praise be to God, you're here. Because you recognize your unworthiness and you come and you come and come and repent and you ask for forgiveness and because of your willingness to understand that Christ forgives those that ask for forgiveness, you are made clean. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, if Matthew is an example of following after Christ, then when you go back to your homes, after you're done with this service, when you're eating out, when you're at your schools, how are you sharing the gospel to those people? And here's the beautiful thing. Some of you are like, Pastor, I don't know how to talk to people. Who did Matthew go to? All the other people that he knew. Other tax collectors that he hung out with, according to Ellen White other sinful people that he indulged in pleasure and sin with. He went back to those people that he knew. So you, go back home. Go to your associates. Go to your best friends.
and share with them just how powerful Jesus Christ is. Today we are being called to be Matthews. We are called to be Andrews and Peters. We are called to be disciples, not of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but of Jesus. And because of that, we are Adventists who go out sharing the good news that we have. We are Seventh-day Adventists because we believe in the tenets of Adventism. And we believe that these are the things that God has called us to. These are the truths that we have. Amen? So why not share it with your best friend next door or your co-worker? Why not? Allow them to understand and see the beauty of these things that we have been taught. Along with that, sharing with them that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. That Jesus is the one that changed you. That Jesus is the one that allows you to go out and do these things. I'm going to leave with, leave with you one last passage from Ellen White again. This is from Ministry of Healing, page 143. One of, this first portion is one of my favorite, favorite passages from Ellen White. But it's going to go on a little bit further. It says this, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs. He won their confidence. And then he bade them, follow me. But it doesn't stop there. There is a need to come close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing. Did I say that right? Right? Pastor, that means that you and I shouldn't have to be preaching that much, right? Right? You should be doing the preaching. This is what Ellen White says. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor would be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed and the in in inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Accompanied by the power of persuasion and the power of prayer, the power of the love of God, this will not and cannot be without fruit. You are the ministry. You are what God is calling to go out and minister to the people on how the Lord has changed you. You don't come to church to just listen to a good sermon. You come to church to be reminded of how God has changed you so that you can go out those doors and into the community around you and say, hey, let me share with you my God. Jesus is calling you to be a Matthew. Jesus is calling you to be a John, a Peter, an Andrew. Jesus is calling you today. How will you respond? And start our hymn notes to hymn number 373, 373, Seeking the Lost. Oh, 
to our patla so after the prayer and the deacon will guide us out from the front to the back so shall we all bow down for the prayer loving heavenly father lord i pray help us lord to make that big decision to open up our hearts to you O oh lord please enter in our hearts Help us, Lord, to rise up and follow you and your will. And as we go our separate ways, Lord, I pray that you please fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may be a light to the community, to our workplace, to our school, and to our family. Lord, help us, Lord. Help us to keep, keep us from the evil ones, and Lord, Use us to finish your work. We love you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> 